So, welcome to our workshop, uh, for our energy workshop, uh, which is called the Compact and Sustainable Heat Storage Solution for Clean Energy. And at today's event, we will disseminate project which is called Heat Inside. And Heat Inside is acronym from long title, which is bringing advanced heat battery in residential heat and electric system close to market through real life demonstration in different climate zones. So my name is Yulia Galaga. I will chair this session and um, I'm from TNO. TNO is Dutch Institute of Applied Scientific Research. And uh, before I will start, I will show you program of the day. And uh, at the beginning, I will make short introduction to Heat Inside project. And then we will have uh, four speakers. It's four partners of the project. And uh, our speakers will address different aspects of technology development, starting from material and to development of the concept for the heat storage and uh, also implementation in different stage and the demonstration of the heat batteries in different locations. So, uh, to start introduction to this project, I want to say why we start this development. What is our motivation? So the ma main motivation is our society is uh, aim for sustainable society, reduction of uh, CO2 emission, and uh, reducing of uh, fossil uh, fuel and EU, as well as all other countries in the world, are uh, aimed for electrification with having a goal by 2030 to have 32% of renewable energy. We also support this goal, but development of sustainable energy, uh, in many cases we use uh, wind, we use solar energy, and one of the issues with this development, although the level of electrification is very high, the main issue of this technology that supply is not always uh, constant. As there is some fluctuation in supply energy, and uh, the energy and demand of energy is not merged with our supply. And where we use the energy? So if you look on the picture, more than 50% of the total energy is used for heat. If we look on build environment, the figures even more. Of course, this variation depends on the country, but in average, like 64% of energy in houses used for heating. And as I already mentioned, to have a merge between supply and demand, sometimes we need to think about the storage energy because we have a lot of solar energy produced in summer, but the heating we need is mostly in winter. Then we need to think about the seasonal heat, and also, if you look a short time, look about the day, we also have sun energy during the day, but also we need to heat our apartment at night. So that's why we need to develop the strategy how to uh, save the energy and to develop the battery. Of course, one of the concepts to make electric battery, but because most of the energy used for heat, in this project we are developing heat battery. So how we can store the energy in form of heat. And the main objectives of this project is basically it's innovation action. And in this project, we aim to bring our technology for TRL-7 and to develop advanced prototype for the heat storage, which will be uh, fitting four main uh, requirements is provide affordable energy. So affordable, it means that the energy should not be very expensive and be affordable for all citizens. And then it should be compact system because we would like to aim installation of this heat battery in our houses and not all, the, all houses have enough space for the large heat batteries. And then it should be robust, aiming for long uh, lifetime. and. Uh, of course, sustainable, using sustainable and uh, green materials. And of course, we aim for versatile energy that allow to charge the battery directly from the grid and save our energy. And oh, I was too fast, sorry. As we aim 
to demonstration uh, and validation of our system in the real environment. Uh, the main concept is to integrate our heat battery into real houses, where it's also combined with other heating systems, uh, such as uh, solar panels, heat pumps, and um, allowing direct charging of the battery from the um, uh, solar systems. Having this as a goal, we of course have a lot of challenges, and some of the challenges how we can integrate all these systems together, and how we can test all this battery in real uh, user conditions, so in real environment. To have validation of our system, we decide that we will validate our system in different climate zones. So different climate zones, basically we select three locations, and these locations are provided by partners of the project, and we install our heat battery in France, in the Netherlands, and in uh, Poland. Although all these three countries are in Europe, it's not a huge difference in the climate, but still, uh, Temperature-wise, we have a France, which is an average temperature in winter, so about 7 degrees. But in, uh, in Poland, in Gdansk, we have temperature which is going below 0 degrees. And uh, the difference not only in the temperature, the difference also in the number of sunny days, because uh, our system is connected to solar panels, and the amount of energy which we can harvest with the um, sunlight is also vary from different locations. That is one of the challenges, having three different demonstrators, but the other challenge is that all three locations, it's real uh, houses, and uh, of course condition and installation in, in, the, in each houses are individual, so they are not really copy-paste and is adapted for the real locations. So, such, we start development of our heat battery, and we start the project in October of uh, 2019, but we did not start from the scratch. By that moment, uh, TNO and the Technical University of Eindhoven have already had already uh, a bit of uh, redevelopment, and they demonstrate developed the first demonstrator for the, of the heat battery, which based on which basically you can see it's on picture, and it's based on three or four sorry uh, basic components where we have reactor where the thermochemical reaction occur. We have also condenser and um, evaporator, which can spray water or remove the water. We have a heat exchanger uh, to extract the heat from the system and ventilator to distribute the heat. Based on this concept, in the project, we further develop the concept and move from lab scale uh, demonstrator to more or less industrial uh, demonstrator or close to industrial demonstrator where all these four components were upscale and uh, integrated in a larger system which can provide sufficient, um, sufficient heat. With this battery, basically we have three main challenges. The first challenge is the material. Because, as I say, the material should be robust and should allow us to use this battery over a longer period of time. Uh, material should be also scale up to industrial scale and uh, uh, to provide sufficient lifetime. The second challenge is development of the battery itself, develop of individual components and also assemble all the components into the battery system. And the third challenge is integration this battery into the real environment and management of uh, uh, entire energy systems. So, that is our work plan, and we in our project we have 14 partners, uh, which are distributed all over the Europe, with uh, six countries, and the three user cases I already presented, which are demonstrated in Poland, uh, Netherlands, and France. And the budget of the project is about 8 million. And this project started in October of 2019. And at this moment, we are in the final stage uh, of the project. The battery is developed. The batteries are installed. 
and we are now in the last six months of testing the battery in real uh, real houses. And work plan basically it's collect nine uh, interconnected work packages. The first, the main idea of the project, and of course the main drive of the project is the market. We start from market investigation, and based on the market requirements, we make some specifications for our battery, what is the size, what is the power, and based on this specification, we start developing the prototype. And uh, four technical work packages, it's material development, component development, uh, development of the system and integration of the system into entire heat uh, infrastructure. And then we have also demonstrator and supporting with management and uh, dissemination of packages. And uh, by having 14 partners, I just want to present who we are. And we have partners all over entire the value chain, uh, starting from material development, then engineering. Uh, we have uh, university and we have research institutes, but we also have uh, partners, uh, industrial partners. And uh, we have engineering company, which can also help us to develop uh, hardware. And we also uh, very much link to the final end users, and we have uh, municipality in the consortium, we have housing corporation, and we have company who is uh, building construction companies. So basically, uh, from material to final implementation, we have partners all over the value chain. That is, was a short introduction about the project. And I would like to thank you for your attention, although it's just the beginning, because next uh, to me, uh, we will have four speakers who will present our technology in more details. So I, I can ask, because I will also chair the session, then uh, as a chair, I can ask you, do you have any questions? Uh, you can ask it now, but also you can keep it for later, because after uh, all presentations, uh, we will have kind of plenary session, and plenary discussion, where you can ask all your questions to all our speakers. Yeah. Good. Then it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Henk Honing, from the Technical University of Eindhoven. And Henk will tell us about the material development. So material, storage materials, working principle, and manufacturing. Yes. You want it from, from stick or from here? No, no, no. From here? I found a quick way. Ah, cool. Yes. The floor is yours. Right, my name is Henk Heuning. I'm Associate Professor in the Physics Department in Eindhoven. And of course, here as member of this um, heat site heat, heat uh, consortium. In the consortium, I was work package leader of the materials development group, which consists of more than only the university. We also had Caldic, uh, a big um, worldwide global trader of chemicals, Ivonik, a uh, large company on board to um, develop materials. And I would like to dig a bit into the working principle behind the materials and also the challenges of manufacturing because what I want to go through is first of all give you a bit of background on Tumaga. I don't know what your background is, that might be very diverse. So, uh, and I think it's handy to have a bit of a kind of technical insight. Then I will talk about the challenges. Then finally, I go to the objectives and the approach, let's say within the materials development part of the project, and say then a few things about size. And size refers to size of particles we use, power and stability, and finally about manufacturing. I think because it's, although it's the last bit, I think it's a very important part. Let's first start with the background. <coughs> um, Julia already said a few things about that. Um, if you look at the device, this is a schematic picture, you'll see it more today. Um, but in the heart of the, uh, the system, there is a material. I hope you can all see it, of course. And if you look really, zoom in onto the material, what you will see is a bunch of atoms. And the key thing is the water molecule in there. Um, it's a salt. You know, might know salt as kitchen salt, but salt is a general class. And water is doing the job. 
And it works a bit like this. Um, if you have a salt like potassium carbonate, that's one, the one you see here, and that's the one we used in the project, it reacts with water. Water is built into the structure of the material that delivers heat. And the hope is then that you can use that heat. And if you have heat available, or any source which can generate heat <coughs> electricity, you want to push it the other way around. Now then you have the basic principle. So you need water vapor and you need salt. In the device, it will look a bit like this. And Julia already introduced that. You'll see it later on in Tom's presentation in more detail. Basically, four components. You have to evaporate, and I show you here a discharge cycle. Uh, you have to evaporate water. Then you have cold, humid air. You bring it to your salt storage where there are particles. That's where the water absorbs into the solid and heat is released. As a consequence, the air is dried, but also increased in temperature. You bring the heat then to a heat exchanger and then you bring it to whatever you want to use it. Um, you might ask yourself, um, does it supply enough heat? If you think that in such a salt, potassium carbonate, there is approximately a density of water, which is the half of liquid water, to give you an idea. So there's enormous amount of water in there. Um, to understand how it's used, I want to give you a bit more physics there. I hope you can bear that today. Uh, what you see on the right, on the left, you see what I already saw, on the, what, you already, what I already talked about. On the right, you see what we call a phase diagram as physicist and chemist. What you see on the x axis is the temperature, on the y axis is the water vapor pressure. You can relate that to relative humidity. Uh, we evaporate water and bring that to the salt. So, if you want to know if a material is suitable for what you want to do, you, ne you need to know this. Phase diagram. The red line is where the reaction happens. And so above the red line, nothing happens, or basically it means that if you are above the red line, water absorbs the salt, heats the delivery. If you are below the red line, before the vapor pressure and temperature, then you dry the salt. Now, then you immediately understand how the connection is between your evaporator and the temperature you can feed to your evaporator. Um, because the saturation line is the blue line there. If, and as an example, let's say your condenser is at 10 degrees and you feed that, let's say, and you make sure that it remains 10 degrees. Then you can generate, for example, 12 millibar water. If you bring that to this particular salt at max, and that's then really, really, really the theoretical maximum. In reality, it's always lower and that never higher. You can generate 60 degrees Celsius there. But that's a theoretical upper limit. Now, this is a bit the principle. Now going to the challenges, um, first of all, we bring it into a device. And a key thing is that humid air flows through the device. And for that, you need to make sure that there's sufficient permeability in there. Now, that sounds quite technical, but if you have no good permeability, basically you have to put a lot of pressure over the system to drive the flow, and pressure means putting a lot of energy in. So for your COP, it's very important that the flow properties are proper, uh, and meaning that there's a small pressure drop over your system. Now that brings me to the first challenge. We need particles, and the question is how big should the particles be? Simply buying a bunch of salt at Evonik, at that place, which was at that time the manufacturer, and throw it in will not work. So we have to make particles. And then the question is, is the power output of the particle sufficient? Because if that power output is too low, then all the rest will be anyway lower. How good our engineers are. That's the upper limit. And then very important, stability of the particles. And that's then, and I think that's a challenging question related to the use case. How many cycles want, do you want to go? And then you have to pack that and give it a proper energy density. So a few things about size and manufacturing, and there you see the, the optimization uh, procedure we went through, pure the, on the technical side. We had energy density of the particle, so whatever we do with the particle, which dilutes out the active ingredient, reduces the energy density. On the other hand, um, 
you have a thing like the bed permeability, you want to have as big particles as possible because then you can flow easily. Problem, if you make the particles too big, then your particle power, let's say the reaction speed of your particles drops. Now, how did we solve that? We solved that by going to, let's say, disk-like particles where you have one side which is very thin, so that promotes the reactivity, the power, one side which is quite big, which ensures that you still have a good permeability. And very important, um, manufacturability. And there you see the importance of having various partners in the chain um, because in order to make such a particles, you need the diameter. Objectives, we worked along. Optimization of the particles with respect to power and density, I said, said it already. Stabilization of the particles. And then finally, a upskilled and low cost and industrial feasible TCM production method. And that was from the start on in the project important. So uh, we didn't want to make lab scale materials. In the end, we had to demonstrate that we could make it on a ton scale. We have, let's say, a relatively low cost approach. And we also had to make it on ton scale because um, the devices were on that level. And that meant that from the start on, we, we, we always looked to existing particle production technologies, which were off the shelf available in companies. Things like, if you're a bit familiar with chemical engineering, if you want to make a particle, either you tablet them, you know that from pharmaceutics, or you compact them. So basically, ways to press powder into a shape. Here you see a bit of the, the results. First of all, optimization of the size. I already said we, on purpose, went to particles. And you see them basically here. So you give a, get a bit of an impression of the size. That was based on things like measuring the flow characteristics, so that the pressure is small enough over the device, making sure and that you see in the lower <coughs> graphs that the reactivity is still sufficient, that you get power outputs, which we wanted. Um, we wanted to have in the range of 50 kilowatt, um, 50 watt per kilogram in that range. And then finally, we should be able to produce them. Here you see the, the final specs. That's maybe technical, but very important for the ones who uh, develop the device. What we have now reached in the project is that on what we call bed level, so if you make a bunch of particles and you put it in a, let's say, a reactor, this is basically the, the level we have now for energy density, and that's basically quite hardly limited by the particle itself. If you want to go beyond that, you really have to take or to find another material, and that's really dictated by nature. These are the power densities we get. In, that, uh, in terms of per kilograms and per cubic meter. And then stability for the moment I define in terms of the increase in pressure drop we see over cycling. So we did cycles with the, with the bats and then over 10 cycles we found a five to 10 fold increase in pressure drop. And then very important, um, we did the cost calculations together with uh, the, the partners on the materials and there were basically two things important in these cost calculations. The first thing was that um, we switched over to another base material and, got not and the reason was that that would deliver us sufficient power output but that give a cost increase. And then we are also um, oh yeah, more or less tackled by the Ukraine kairos or tackled, I would not say, but it also had quite some impact. Our base material, potassium carbonate, starts with what we call potassium chloride. Belarus is one of the main producers of that, mine, mining countries. Now, then you imagine that this price goes up. Next to that, there is uh, the price of energy went up. If you want to make KCL over into potassium carbonate, you do an electrolysis process as one of the steps. Now, there you plug in a lot of electricity. It's the price goes down. So it was going up really too far. But then you have a bit of a view from the scale. 
Finally, a few words about manufacturing. Here you see the full manufacturing chain, starting from the base material milling, mixing with graphite, and that is uh, the additive to, to make it possible. Tableting, filling the module and packaging, and that all on a ton scale by different parts. And I think uh, this was uh, my contribution so far. Uh -huh. Can you say a word uh, yes. uh, yep. to the energy density? Well, this is a material which you can maybe also use for long-term storage, <coughs> but maybe it's not really the intention to have long-term storage. But uh, from the size, uh, all of, for example, a normal, normal heating system where you have a, a storage with water is nearly the same size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And compared to that, how is how bit better is the energy? Now, you, you mean the storage duration? Yes, yes. Yeah. No, the, 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 the content, the energy, yes. energy stored. Let me see. I think I have to do it by heart, so I can make mistakes there. But if you heat up water 50 degrees, um, I think the typical storage density to compare with this is of the order of at max 0.1. It will be in that range. Ten yeah. times, ten times more. Yeah, it, 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 this, this, this is ten times more than that. Okay. And compared, for example, there are other materials in the market, like, uh, for example, in the washing dishwasher, uh, dish, in the dishwasher, you have a uh, single light. Uh, compared to that. Um, okay, that's a nice story. That's a nice discussion because then it's all about um, how you can charge. I think single lights can be comparable. Even that you can charge at high temperatures. Okay. Yeah, and that means going up to 200 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. And here we were targeting really for charging below 100 degrees Celsius. If you go to 200 degrees Celsius, yes, then sea lights would be uh, comparable. Mm -hmm. no, <coughs> yeah, they have advantages, I think. Yeah. And uh, here it's, this is a salt. Yeah. It's a say a few things about that and then maybe Tom can also later on connect to that. Um, in, in general, and you know that from your kitchen salt, is that every salt has a certain level of humidity where it comes with some liquid. Yeah. 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 For example, you, the humid hot day in sauna, yeah. you will get your stick, you will not find a nice, a nice uh, salt grain back yeah. Yeah, but it becomes sticky. So. <coughs> for example, this salt does that at a lower relative humidity as kitchen salt, but still sufficiently high enough that you can make a control system around that. So basically it means that you should in your battery avoid to immediately go at room temperature to, let's say, an 80 degrees relative humidity. Mm -hmm. right? Do that step by step. If you heat up your battery mm -hmm. to operational level, I think the main advantage of TCMs, I think you already see that there's quite some complexity in that. The main advantage is, I think, twofold, technically done. Um, I think it's the upgrade function. It has a bit of a neat upgrade function. Mm -hmm. That's one. Second thing is the, um, the lossless um, storage. Oh, yeah. I think that are the two key assets. Um, storage density is important. But you can debate the dot because uh, in a system that dilutes out very quickly, and then you get this discussion. Was it patented before? Because the, the, a lot of yeah, the, the, mixers are not patented. Yeah, the salts are not, not patented because uh, it is pretty difficult to patent. Uh, what has been patented is the, 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 the basic reactor principle, mm -hmm. and we painted the, the production procedure of the, the particles. Mm -hmm. So it was not a problem to get this. Uh, Salt in, in, uh, uh, 
this condition, considering that, of course, the, the phenomenon is, uh, is driven by uh, thermochemical forces, of course, yeah. but also I suppose that the, the specific heat and the thermal conductivity of the salt at different temperatures could, could influence the performance of the system itself. Yeah, we didn't do, do that in this framework, but um, in our lab we did a study on heat conductivity, for example, of the materials. Um, as all salts, the, the heat conductivity properties are common. Mm. Yeah, no. um, is it a problem here? Here it's not a problem. Uh, and it depends on the type of system we operate here. We work here with an uh, effective driven system, basically you blow air and it's charged with humidity. And, um, the, the heat capacity of the air is still sufficient um, big to track, let's say, the heat from the particles. So we don't have a problem with heat conductivity over the particles. That, that's also what we see, let's say, in the principle. If you would use another reaction principle, but then it becomes very technical, where you base yourself on pure humidity, you have no uh, carrier gas, then it's really a problem. And that's also what you see in the literature. Right? And a lot of efforts to throwing carbon or whatever is not good. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, take a question. Yeah, thank you. Maybe I have missed the slide. Uh, what is the efficiency of the, of the charging and discharging? So this ETA. Uh, good question. I guess that uh, you <laughs> can respond later on that. Because that's, I think you should okay. assess that really on system level. I think. Okay. Uh, yeah. okay. But that's a good question to you, too, I think, too. Yeah. Yeah. And I also didn't get uh, what is the temperature of the heat coming out. <laughs> okay, good. Um, I have to be careful because the testing is still, on the demo level, mm -hmm. the testing is still going on. What I know from the lab, you come and let's say 40, 45, 45 plus degrees Celsius. Because I saw the, the theoretical upper limit. Mm -hmm. It's 60, right? That's 60. That's 60. But that's then... Limit. That's the limit. They, they are determined limit. It basically means that there's no reaction at all. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's the edge. So you're planning to install also heat pump with... Yeah, the idea is to... Okay. to yeah. You will know, get it from our next... Uh, <laughs> ah, okay. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I think, but I think there also, that was the reason precisely that I showed the phase. Like you see that some choices in the material, they are really deeply rooted in the material, and consequences you can play with, but that, that are the typical things you cannot change. And just maybe for a quick one, it can be yes or no. Uh, can you scale it up? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what do you mean, scale up production? Or? Uh, scale, uh, scale up in, in, uh, in a, can it be megawatt hour size? Oh yes, yes. But I think they are talking about because they are. The next, next speaker will talk about that. <laughs> yeah, but I it's a good moment to introduce <laughs> our next speaker. Our next speaker is Tom Chairman from SME Celsius, and Tom will tell us about the development of compact domestic heat storage prototype. <laughs> so it's basically on prototype level. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, as I was just introduced, my name is Tom Sherman. I work as an engineer for Celsius, the company that has developed the heat battery together with TNO and TUE. And uh, today I will tell you about exactly how the battery works, what the key components are. We've already been over this by Hank, so I'll be quick. Um, but then also how we've improved on this design how we've uh, scaled it up, how we've made it better for domestic use. And I want to show you the <coughs> few points that we've hit, the results that we are making. Um, so first off, this picture that you've seen already twice. Um, uh, I will be quick, but yes, the battery in essence consists of four parts. A fan to drive air and heat through the system evaporator condenser to con control the moisture in the air, the reactor filled with the salt that Hank was just talking about, and the heat exchanger to utilize the heat. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, um, so um, we can use this TCM in two ways. Uh, we can discharge to generate heat. So this is this process when we add water. So we start with cold, dry air, 
Does this work? No. We start with cold, dry air in the fan. We blow it through our evaporator to increase the moisture level, which leads to cold, wet air. This cold, wet air blows through our reactor. And there, like Hank explained, we basically exchange the water for heat. So we end up with warm, dry air, which we can then uh, remove using uh, our heat exchanger. And the other way around, um, if we blow the other way, we can use our heat exchanger to heat up the air and uh, in the reactor exchange our heat again for water. So we end up with cold, wet air, which we can then condense in our condenser. So we end up back with cold, dry air. and We can start the cycle over again. This is the very basic principle of the heat battery. Um, um, but this, uh, as we, you already mentioned, we need to work in tandem with a heat pump. Um, because a heat pump is really good at making low temperature heat, so up to 40, maybe 45 degrees of heat, a uh, heat pump has a very high COP uh, in the order of four. Um, which is really great, but they're not really that good at making high temperature uh, for showering or to combat Legionella or something like that. And that's where the Celsius heat battery comes in. Uh, as Hank just explained, the heat that we can deliver is based uh, on how warm our evaporator is. If we increase the temperature of the evaporator, we can produce more moistness in the air, so to speak. We can increase the vapor pressure. Increasing the vapor pressure increases the reaction, leading to higher temperatures. So we can use the heat pump um, and the low temperature buffer to upgrade that heat uh, very, very efficiently to high temperature heat that you can use uh, for your warm water supply. Um, and for this, uh, in a domestic environment, we have uh, set some targets because we want to have a battery that's not only nice but also useful. So first off, we want to have a storage capacity of 200 megajoules, about 55 kilowatt hours. Um, this was chosen because this is on average what a normal house would need for an entire week uh, of warm water without having to charge the battery a single time. So we can bridge along. This is warm water. Only warm water. Only warm water. Um, we have a, a discharging power in, uh, of 500 to 1500 watts and a charging power of 500 to 2000 watts. This is based on simulations that are done by CEA to see how we can uh, utilize the battery most optimal. And finally, we want to have a modular system, a small modular system that's uh, capable of being installed in a lot of places in the house. Um, because we can build an amazing battery that has, can deliver 10,000 watts, but if it's the size of another house, not many people want that in their basement. Um, so based on that, we started with, um, oh wait, it doesn't work, this first prototype that uh, Yulia also showed you, uh, more of a proof of concept. Uh, it's a very simple battery, utilizing only the four parts that we mentioned before, um, but it of course has some obvious drawbacks. First off, it's a prototype and you can't really install it in your house. Um, and secondly, it's missing some upgrades. So in the following years, we have um, upgraded this design. Uh, on the left, the big metal box is the entire TCM reactor. This one is significantly larger than the small little pan we saw on the left. This is one uh, cubic meter, if I'm not mistaken, of TCM material. Um, I think maybe even more. Um, and on the right, we have the big black tower, which has all the other components that we were talking about. It has our evaporator, condenser, heat exchangers, fans, etc. cetera. Um, this battery is a great improvement, but it's missing the key part that we were saying. Uh, this is hard to install in your house because the thing on the left is already four square meters uh, of floor space. I'm not sure what your house looks like, but mine doesn't fit. So uh, in the end, we end up with this final design. Um, it is the same principle where we have on uh, the right uh, the TCM reactors, so a big box with these salt particles. And on the left, we have a tower of heat exchangers, fans, and um, evaporators, condensers, you name it. Um, with the added benefit that this one is very modular, um, 
I think we'll see a movie in the ne uh, next presentation, presentation after, where you can see exactly uh, that every part of this is modular and easily uh, taken apart and built back up again. And it only requires one square meter of floor space, uh, making it possible to install this in a, most homes um, that have a bit of extra space. Um, Ah, yeah, I want, if you, in case you're interested, so we put the evaporator condenser in the middle there, uh, TCM reactors on the right. We split up this heat exchanger into two uh, for efficiency reasons. So we have one dedicated heat exchanger to remove heat and give it to an end user. And we have one dedicated heat exchanger to introduce heat so we can recharge the battery. Um, and we still have our fan, of course. Uh, but we also added some new functions. Um, we included the heat recovery loop in this design. Um, we do this because when we are evaporating or we are condensating, um, we tend to lose a lot of heat. For instance, you're discharging your battery, you've generated heat, and in the top part you have removed that heat for an end user, um, but you're still left over with an airflow of about 50 degrees because that's the starting point you had and then you want to evaporate at 35 degrees. Then you would lose 15 degrees just because you are not hitting the right temperatures, which is a waste, uh, and we don't want that. So by using this uh, heat recovery loop, which is an uh, interconnected set of heat exchangers, we can uh, perform sort of a heat bridge, take away these 15 degrees before we start evaporating, and reintroduce them after the evaporating has finished. Um, which allows us to save upwards of 80% of the heat, um, drastically increasing system efficiency. Secondly, we have introduced valve separation. Um, Hank already told you that one of the biggest problems with this material is the cycling. And if we cycle the material a lot of times, uh, the pressure drop increases and the efficiency goes down. One way to solve this, uh, at least on a prototype level, is to not discharge all of your salt at once. We have separated our TCM reactor basically into 10 small reactors, giving us 10 small batteries, which not only allows for us to um, balance out the charging and discharging over these boxes so we keep a higher efficiency for longer, it also uh, is easier for an end user because you don't have to use, uh, if you start using uh, the battery to generate heat, you don't have to recharge it before you can use it again. You have 10 char uh, charges left, so to say. Um, all of this we have implemented in some real prototypes. Uh, this first battery we installed in Eindhoven, a uh, city in the Netherlands. Um, and we installed it as a complete domestic heating system. So here we built a heat shed uh, that is uh, possible to place inside a, a garden of an end user. Um, which not only houses a heat battery, but it's a complete integrated heating system. So a heat pump, a battery, um, buffer vessels, and all the auxiliary equipment you can need, like pumps or uh, sensors. Um, this was done uh, because, firstly, it also has special heat absorption panels on the top, so we can easier generate uh, heat to charge the battery with. And because it's our first prototype, this allows us to do some more experiments on site without having to bother the owners every day, um, because at one point they get really sick of you. Um, but it's also possible, as I mentioned, to do a direct installation in a house, so skipping the shed entirely. Um, we will see that in the next presentations about France and uh, Poland. Uh, now I want to show you what we can do with this. So here we have a typical uh, discharging cycle where we see that we are generating heat. And for this one, we, have, uh, we wanted to reach a discharging power 500 minimum, but 1500 was like desired. And you can see that at peak, we do reach 1500 watts and we stay stable for around 1000 watts for about an hour, an hour and a half. And then we start to drop off a bit more. This is because we are yeah, losing the energy in the salt, we've finished one box. And um, we have been able to use this heat to heat a high temperature buffer from 40 degrees to 55 degrees. Um, these temperatures here are chosen purely based on the wishes of the end user. 
Uh, they didn't need. A water yes, a water buffer. Yes, a, uh, a warm water buffer for your shower, for instance. Um, so this one, great success. Then the next one, we want to charge based with leftover power. So like I said, we have solar panels, uh, PV and PVT panels on this roof. And we want to charge um, with 2,000 watts. But as you can see, we smashed that. And we are able to charge with almost 3,000 watts of power based on solar availability, um, allowing us to uh, store more heat and therefore save more energy, which is very preferable to the end user. And uh, finally, the storage capacity we want to hit. Like I mentioned, we have these 10 modules now inside this battery. Each contains about six kilowatt hours of uh, heat storage, um, which leads to a total heat capacity of 60 kilowatt hours, which is uh, more than the 55 that we wanted. Um, so with all this in mind, uh, this battery is doing really well. Of course, we can improve a lot on it. But right now, uh, it's being tested as we speak in Eindhoven and also in the other demo locations. Um, this was my quick introduction of the battery. I hope I wasn't too quick. If there's any questions, please let me know. Um, not as big as you think. So yes, uh, if you want to keep this battery intact, never touch it for 50 years, you're going to have a problem. But due to the fact that it's both a modular system and we can uh, take each box separately, so to speak, um, we can perform uh, not just the 10 cycles Hank mentioned, but the effect of 100 cycles. Before, you need to uh, change the salt or re- um, basically remake the solar particles, which, according to our calculations, should uh, be able to be done by us in a once or twice, once a year, once a two year basis. About the same as you would normally have your normal heating uh, regularly scheduled <coughs> maintenance. So um, yes, it's a bit cumbersome, and we are really working on improving this, but for now it's doable. So if you have that sort of uh, reinvigoration process, whip all the units out to replace them, what, what's, your, what's your cost for doing that, roughly? <laughs> um, not as a service necessarily, but just as a as material. So. Um, well, the, the, the regeneration is not that costly. Um, the, most, the most things that happen that causes the material to degrade is that not, uh, when you uh, take in the water, the particle expands a bit because water gets added, and you remove the water, and the expansion still stays. Even you would. Maybe I can comment on this. Uh, the principle of regeneration is quite similar to the principle of the process itself. So the only thing is that the raw material cost drops out, and that means roughly that you reduce 70 80% of your costs. Because the raw material itself costs not only that amount. And especially if you go to large scales. And because on large scale, if you go to large scale, and then the personnel cost drops. Now and in five years' time, when you've got a scaled <laughs> process, or is it? I don't know, I don't like committing people's numbers, but just uh, a. The numbers, numbers are going to be really difficult to say because a uh, big part of the cost of the battery as a whole is also the. Well, the, the, the cost of the there that, uh, for this particular material, I would say, order of three to four euros per kilogram. Three to four euros per kilogram, how many kilograms in a kilogram? This one has, um, the correct, I think, 200 kilograms in total okay. of uh, salt. Thank you, you too. So this uh, means, yeah, 200 kilograms. Which one? Oh, horrible questions to be asked. <laughs> no, 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 that's why we're here. We want to know the real, the real story. That's why we're here. That's, um, that's also why I'm searching for, still searching for cheap. Because you have to imagine if we are if we are able to maybe slightly tweak our process and get from ten cycles to twenty cycles, your yearly cost halves. You had also the question, I think. Or yeah, oh, you asked the price. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. Just please come back to the slide with the charging with the solar. Um, why does it go up and down? Ah, because. 
this charging is based purely on the available solar energy. And with available solar energy, it's not just clouds, but um, we are talking about leftover solar energy. Maybe uh -huh. just the because we have a house, and you want to charge a battery with the energy that you're not using, but you are generating during the middle of the day. Um, but at this point, um, I believe somebody came home around 25 minutes, I took a shower or something, um, used the energy for a bit, and then went away again. So that's the big dips are usually energy usage, or in a bad situation, it is the Netherlands sometimes clouds come in five minutes and there's no sun at all. Um, but yes, the reason for this is it's leftover PV energy, not just generating. Uh, sorry, was it PV energy or was it solar thermal? Both. Um, uh, in general, we use, um, for this one, uh, uh, for this one, uh, no, actually this one is only PV. Right. Uh, we do have solar PV uh, or PV term thermal panels as well, but for this demo, they do not feed directly into the charging. Uh, so this one's just done by using uh, uh, an electric heater to generate heat with leftover PV to store it to the battery. I guess the follow-up for that is obviously there you've got big intermittency almost in your charging process. Does that have any negatives for the charging process? Would it be better having a stable I mean, charge? I would prefer to, of course, I would prefer to have a stable situation, but um, these fluctuations, uh, these time scales of minutes, are manageable. Um, what's really uh, crucial, because um, when you start charging, um, we need to have a temperature difference of about 60 degrees to effectively charge the battery. Um, and if at the first five minutes, I don't have it. I need to heat up my system a bit uh, and get the heat in there, and then we can start really charging the battery. What's really detrimental is if I can heat my battery to the point where I can charge, and then I stop for four hours, and then I do it again, and I stop. Then, at that point, you're not effectively charging the battery, but um, that doesn't really happen uh, that often in real cases. Uh, unless you can predict it, like, okay, if I start charging at 6 p.m., I know I'm not going to finish, so that's not. Okay, then I think we <laughs> need to go on. And yes. uh, thank you, Tom. No problem. And uh, I will introduce our next speaker. Next speaker will be Etienne Bors from CA. And uh, in the project, CA was uh, active in many tasks. Uh, from uh, component development, uh, numerical modeling, and also uh, one of the exciting part, I see provides a platform for one of the three prototypes, and uh, all these results you will now hear from Etienne, and you can see in his presentation.
decided to try not only uh, the uh, domestic water but also uh, the heating. And the idea was uh, to, uh, to see what happened when uh, uh, with the water and with heating. For the moment, uh, we have still six months of operation. So uh, we propose mostly uh, some uh, uh, domestic water tests, and we hope to have some tests on uh, uh, heating during uh, winter time because we are supposed to finish it next month. So you see a very small house uh, and a very complex installation for a small house. And for sure, I'm not sure that in the future. The individual house will be the, the best uh, uh, objective of this kind of storage. But again, it was the coal <laughs> which asked it, and we did it for the coal. And the coal was uh, are you able to uh, propose some storage for one cubic meter, uh, as I remember, uh, for an individual house? So also to the corner for this week, we get uh, the project. So you see it's a little bit complex and as you have said you have many tasks in the project. Uh, one very important task was the simulation part and at first we try to simulate what happened to uh, uh, one year. Uh, then we, uh, we have some tests on the level also uh, but uh, what was more interesting is to test uh, at first uh, the installation in CDA. You can see everything is working. And then we had some difficulty and we send it back to Celsius and we get it back. And so that permits to have some operational uh, uh, tool. Uh, here you have the, the water tanks. So again, you need place in, uh, in the house, but we were lucky because in this house we, we had enough places for the reactor, for the, for the tanks and for all the installation. We work with an um, engineering company uh, 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 who uh, specialists on ventilation and so they help us uh, to have some installation uh, uh, done. Uh, so we propose that, but we have no uh, PV on, uh, on the roof, uh, and so we propose a, a heat pump for mm -hmm. domestic water and heating, both solution and PV and storage. So that was uh, what we proposed to the owner. Uh, here you have uh, the simulation. So we use a currencies. solution so Tom uh, didn't agree that I show you the hydraulic system which is very complex <laughs> and it was complex to simulate and here you have the, uh, so the simulation tool uh, for sure we cannot imagine that for individual houses we do so such no work and we have to find some application but uh, the work is very interesting it's so we can have a very interesting application. So here you have the chemical uh, reaction, but uh, for sure, and uh, will explain you better uh, as me, but uh, here you, you have so the, all uh, <coughs> the heating and uh, cooling or on the line parallel to this uh, operating line, and here you have some, some different viewpoints. Uh, that was what we, we get and that uh, uh, we were very happy to, to have uh, this um, reaction on the simulation, on analytical, but also uh, on uh, real, uh, uh, real work. Um, what is interesting here is uh, how we store the uh, energy and we have a lot of different um, uh, uh, type of uh, energy storage, so the 
direct storage, uh, direct solar for the solar heating. Here you have the part of direct solar uh, for the domestic hot water. Hot oh, is something uh, a little complex. Uh, I will not uh, explain. The discharge solar heating, discharge uh, domestic water. For sure, uh, we have a backup uh, for um, the backup for the solar heating and the backup for uh, the uh, domestic water. And that's what you store. And here you can see uh, what happened during one year. In fact, you store during uh, a short time. And that you use it only for uh, the domestic hot water. So that where you store and you discharge and you charge your energy. And at the end of the year, uh, uh, you will discharge. That's what we uh, uh, do at the bus simulation. Because, as I told you, for the moment, we did only uh, experimentation on very uh, small period. And that's one of period. Uh, a test that we do, a real test uh, that we obtain, and here you also you have the, the power for the discharging and uh, the energy that you get during uh, this period. So again, the test is not, but there are real tests on the 13th of July when we begin to have the, the first possibility because we, we want for a year, I don't or you want for three years to have uh, a real uh, uh, prototype and we, we got the prototype in July or afternoon or July so it's really the beginning of the test and for this we don't know we decided to, to continue the project six months more because now it's working and we can test and we hope to show how we can uh, store or, or discharge uh, 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 the reactor uh, for domestic hot water, but I hope also for uh, the heating. And so the, the idea is uh, to get the results during this uh, 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 this fall period. And I hope that uh, in March we, we are able to to show that for a prototype uh, we are able to uh, to manage. And, and know it's working and, and uh, what is very interesting is uh, they even uh, uh, they can drive all uh, the installation from Einoven uh, uh, and try to, to charge or discharge or see what happened uh, uh, by, uh, by the web and uh, we, we get first very good results but it's really the beginning and so it's difficult to show you demonstration when we begin the demonstration. So and here you have some installation in CA that we use for uh, just uh, uh, for tests uh, uh, the first demonstration. Okay. Okay, thank you Etienne. And now we have time for a couple of questions. Are there any? Is uh, all the speakers this uh, Etienne is the last speaker? Or? No, we still have one one more presentation. Yes, I think we have one so more can to talk. Yeah, then Best is to have Okay, the then, then we will have I'm more sorry. time. We might have more time to discuss all sorry. other aspects. And I will introduce uh, uh, Andrzejka Lukaszewska from Fasada, from Poland. And uh, Andrzejka will tell us about the implementation of the heat battery in residential building in Poland. So basically, it's one more example how our technology was really installed and implemented in the real house. Um, because one challenge is to construct a battery, <laughs> and another big challenge is to implement it uh, at home with the uh, people living inside and uh, the building also that is not new. Uh, that I will show you. So uh, a few words um, about that because my <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Um, because we are SME uh, from Poland, on one side we are hiring uh, white collar workers, engineers, architects doing beams, supporting uh, different clients in digitalization, digital twins, but on the other also doing the building renovation and uh, some construction works with blue collar workers. And we decided to join uh, this project to offer to our clients 
new solution that will allow to minimal, minimize the fuel, fossil fuel dependency, because probably all you know, I think Pol Poland is almost famous in Europe for the dependency on the coal, on the gas and the renewables. We are not, uh, I think, as good as maybe other uh, uh, countries in Europe. So this is something that we have to change. And also we see among various client, public uh, authorities interest in the innovative technology. So doing uh, the renovation, also we have, uh, we can, uh, thanks to the project, maybe in the future we can have opportunity to, to just uh, show uh, various, various solutions that they can implement in their um, houses or buildings. Uh, here is the demonstration building in Poland. It's a two-story residential building located in, uh, in Gdynia, it's north of Poland. The owner is the municipality of Gdynia, as well as a social housing, constructed in 1943 and uh, renovated for Polish standards lately, so in uh, 2016. Um, uh, the heating and domestic hot water uh, was, uh, were provided uh, uh, by gas, so the gas boiler was uh, inside uh, the uh, flat. And the demonstration was one flat inside on the, on the ground floor, uh, 60 uh, square meters. Uh, so as you know, our uh, goal was to try to implement the battery and test it and validate it in the real house, in the real condition. So for instance, on the left, you see the staircase, very narrow. <laughs> so uh, at the beginning, uh, uh, all parties were not very happy, but this is the reality. If you want to develop your product, yes, Maybe you have to later, if you want to install in uh, houses, there are different houses with their own requirements and geometry uh, restriction maybe, yes? So that's why we decided, and later you will see, that you can, you can have opportunity to build the, the heat storage even uh, with uh, such a narrow staircase. It was a storage room that we had in the beginning, so we needed to clean the room uh, renovated a little bit and uh, also the gas boiler to which the occupant was very much attached i would say mm. um, so requirements for the installation of the heat battery whereas uh, this time uh, we wanted to install the heat storage inside the house yes not in the shed as next to the house what can be a good solution for instance for the country or uh, for the for the houses with when you have a big yard, yes, but in the city uh, where every square meter of the area is like so valuable, it's very difficult. So you need to do it um, at home uh, inside. Uh, so we had and we wanted to use a dedicated room space for the storage system tanks and uh, uh, or the heat pump installation. Uh, also, the three-phase electrical power supra, supra, uh, supply uh, is required. We had a one-phase, as the building was very old. The building connection power should exceed 12 kilowatts, so also we needed to increase it. Mm, in our case, and in general, in the place of the installation, the connection to both fresh water and domestic hot water, as well as heaters, uh, was needed. Um, and so what's important, but I think in general that the envelope should be insulated and it was in our hack case. Uh, so uh, often uh, together with the heat battery installation, some piping or electrical works need to be done to adjust and have the needed connection in the point of the installation. Uh, so first step. Uh, was the installation of the 12 uh, PV modules uh, with the inverters. So the total power was 5.5 uh, uh, kilowatt of peaks. Uh, we did some plumbing works and uh, installation of the water air heat pump. Here we choose uh, monoblock Panasonic heat pump. And uh, the goal was uh, very important for the, for the city. So the elimination of the gas as a source of the heating and uh, hot domestic water. Such a solution, I think also is because in Poland, in big cities, we are very much uh, relying on the district heating or the gas network. So this is also a good opportunity for the houses that are a little bit 
when the, they are not connected to the district heating or they don't have a gas uh, network, so like an alternative for the coal base uh, furnace, yes, because still we have them in our mix uh, of the production of the heating and hot domestic water. Uh, okay. Here is a small, because the next step, um, to be honest, uh, that we were a little bit afraid of, but was very smooth, and I have a short movie for, uh, for you, was the installation when whole, all the house was ready. There was like a key moment for which we were waiting uh, really for a long time, so installation of the battery. And uh, you can see the movie. The battery was shipped to us on the pallet and our worker were after uh, two days training in Celsius, uh, engineer was uh, assembling the, the battery. It was the prototype, and uh, here was uh, was very smooth. Uh, and I believe that almost uh, every technician, after a short training, can install the um, uh, the battery. So this was something very positive because it appeared that is almost as a plug and play. Yes, because there is no perfect system that you can just like um, in one minute uh, will appear in your house. So for sure, uh, the assembly um, was uh, was like very successful. And here are some conclusion based on the um, on the first uh, on the installation and first our use of the system. So in general, uh, public owners and in general also private owners are very much in, uh, interested in alternatives. Uh, to eliminate fossil fuel dependency. Also, I think it's like something um, in fashion. People are talking about it. Yes, there are people who are willing to pay more, but be independent. And especially because when we started the project, it was before the war, <laughs> before COVID. And now also many things has changed, also in Poland. So there are people who are saying, we are willing to pay more because we will be independent. So we don't care so much, you know, if if something will happen. So the, because the prices of the energy also increase in Poland after after the war, so they want to go uh, for that. Um, as I told you before, the battery uh, itself was uh, quite um, quite smooth and efficient. It's more effort and time need to be dedicated for the connection to the building um, installation and maybe some extra works especially in older building um, needs to be done. Uh, the same, some small uh, challenges uh, also maybe with the installation of the renewables and uh, heat pumps, nevertheless it's happening, yes? So uh, I would say that it's a not a uh, big thing. When it comes to the battery, uh, so for a uh, future, uh, for sure what is a very important aspect and I think in many research projects, we are not paying that attention because it's also related with the earlier, um, I mean, uh, TRL that we are, is the maintenance-free performance, yes? Because one thing is to put, make a short test, short test, even one month, two months, one year, but what after? What if something broken? And if we have a lot of technology, you need to have um, um, somebody, a company behind it, yes, that you know also the process, the maintenance is somehow uh, how long, one per year you need to make um, some kind of uh, checks, yes. So this is something uh, important and the silent operation of the battery, if it's located in in house and make some 
noise. So this was the, the second issue that also because especially during the night when the background is different, during the day when many things are happening, so people are not paying attention. But for instance, during the night is something that, uh, yeah. And in the lab, sometimes you don't care so much or you don't notice that, yes? A little bit different things. But, but, but this is why also the, the we need to have validation if the in the uh, buildings or districts level, yes, because one thing is a lab and another is um, going and installing into into the real buildings and, and flats. So now we are waiting for the results of the of the test. Uh, and for sure some more effort needs to be done for like a smooth uh, installation in the house and this maintenance free process and having all the how to cope, yes, we, if the problem, if the tenants have a problem, who should he or she call? How fast we can react? What is happening? Yes. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do you have a specific question to Angeska? Basically, the, oh, thank you very much. Then uh, we still have. 12 minutes till the end of the workshop and the idea is to turn this 12 minutes uh, to Q&A session. Basically, if you have any questions, you can ask it to all of our speakers. But uh, basically, we did it already quite interactive. Are there any remaining questions from audience? I have a question. Uh, what about the safety issues? Is the material uh, inert, for example, it's completely inert? And no flame, 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 Material at the present outsource from it, the present, let's say, useful materials in the food industry and fertilizer. Oh, okay. So, uh, fertilizer could be explosive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but this isn't the whole explosive. <laughs> <laughs> no. And, uh, no, no, in that sense, the material is really inert and, and quite safe. So, yeah, you should not even get aware of that. But you should also do that with your kitchen. So. <laughs> Project in the, in the Rhine Valley where they want to uh, extract lithium out of the thermal water. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's not only lithium inside, maybe there's also carbon inside. I, I'm not sure if it is. Yes, but but uh, this might be a, so a source which is not in my Russia. Yeah, but I think it's the, the point is, is more there isn't there enough not sources, but of course there are a few sources in the world. And then if you get a crisis, yeah. Then it takes time before, let's say, you rearrange, let's say, basically the, the, the market flows. Okay. It, especially in mining, that's, 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 that's very inert. So my expectations is that it also will fall again. Good. Yes, please. I, I really like the installation side of things, but it's a very <laughs> tricky, look, look fairly easy. Um, so I guess those, those individual cells, they're about 20 kilos mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Um, for the ancillary equipment, I guess that, that also breaks down into sections. Yeah, so um, the, you have the three, we have to build down three uh, components, which are about the size of an old desktop computer. Um, uh, a little bit heavier, but about that size. And then there's a lot of auxiliary equipment that needs to be installed in the current heating system. Um, what I mean by that is uh, you need an extra pump to deliver the, water, the, the heat that you generate to your hot water vessel. Um, but that's best installed somewhere else, Either somewhere else in, in the system. Or if you can't plan for this when you are building it completely, you can do it with one pump and um, a valve or something. But that's something uh, that's also necessary. <coughs> and I guess that ties into the, the question about silent operation. I assume it's the pumps, is it? The, it's the, main uh, source of noise? The, the main source of noise right now is a compressor. The, the valve separation is done by compressed air. Um, and that is one of the biggest points that I told my boss about, even that we're doing compressed air again. Um, because we build these machines um, at a company where we have a big compressor three stories down that you yeah. don't hear. Yeah. And then you're like, oh, this is great. And then you're working in this small cellar, and then every 10 minutes it makes a ruckus, and you're like, ah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I should ask about these concerns. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, uh, that's like, like I guess said, one of the reasons why it's so important that we do real life testing and not just yeah. 
laboratory testing uh, because there's all, always small things that you didn't think about. Like, for instance, the noise of the compressor, that that's, I think, the number one complaint I've gotten about the battery. Yeah. It's not the, it's not the energy, it's not, ooh, uh, it made, ooh, it's, it's ugly now, it's, it makes noise. <laughs> One very final one. I, this is right the way back to probably the first slide. How long have you got left on the project? How long have you got to get data? Um, about six months. Six months. months. Yes. We just ask for extension because we finish this installation, but we notice, yes, we run a couple of tests. Uh, we can extrapolate the data, but for, for real um, validation of this system, we need a bit more time. And commission was very positive and grant us uh, extra uh, extension wow. of the project. So. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah, yes, I, please. Um, I remember because um, no, in a normal uh, 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 hot water system, you mean sometimes temperature should be higher than, than yes. 45 degrees or 55 yes. and yes. near to 60. Yeah, so to, to, to avoid we we can that. go even above. So, so the 60 that Hank showed was the theoretical maximum. Yeah. When you feed your evaporator, yeah. okay, can just stand up. Yeah. Yeah. When you feed your evaporator with 10 degrees of water, so, uh, and then you start evaporating water, you get 12 bars, uh, 12 millibars, sorry, of water vapor pressure. That's 12 bars would maximize, theoretically maximize to 60 degrees centigrade. Okay. However, we can, uh, because we try to use the heat of the heat pump that we can generate very efficiently, we can get our evaporator uh, a lot warmer. We can slowly build it up and get it to 40 degrees, say. Which leads to us having higher vapor pressures. I don't know the exact number you have, 40 degrees, but um, which means that we can get heat out um, realistically, so not theoretically, but realistically at 65, 70 degrees, which is enough to also prevent Legionella yeah, or yeah, diseases yeah. or okay. something like that. So it's, it functions like a normal heating system with the same uh, functionality. Yes. And could you use that maybe also for the thermal? Yes, you, uh, you could. Um, because in the south, south of Europe, there's a lot of photo tunnels. Yeah. <laughs> the, the photo, uh, um, you would probably still need, um, okay, depending on the system. So this is going to be a bit more of a if it, but depending on the system, you might need uh, to still boost the photo uh, thermal water because you need uh, to charge, like I said, this material with about 60 degrees um, of temperature difference between your hot side and your cold side. And practically speaking, your cold side is not going to be zero. Mm -hmm. um, so in the, if your photothermal panels generate, let's say, 55 degrees of warm water, you would still need to boost that a little bit to uh, get it to yeah. charge properly. Yes, feel free to ask questions. We still have to answer. Uh, uh, we still have to answer. Anyone can answer. You've got this slide, brilliant progress. It's just fantastic seeing the systems actually getting installed because I think you learn so much. What comes next? What happens after the six months? Is it more funding? Is it um, private investment? Is it walking away and you know, we learn some lessons? <laughs> um, all of the above. No, um, I think um, we all learn. We are all learning, and we all learn a lot from this project. Uh, if I speak for my company, Celsius, who built PC batteries. We have already um, designed uh, a new version based on what we've learned here and are designing better uh, improvements that I can't mention here. But um, so we can improve the, the design, can improve the battery, and make it even more, uh, more efficient, trying to make it a bit smaller still and especially quiet uh, so we can use it in a different approaches. But I think also the university is still doing research. Uh, on the material side of this, yeah. it's using the information that we're getting from these experiments to further their own work. Yeah, yeah our second generation to do that. Because the, I think the challenges are very clear. If we can, every cycle we get extra basically reduces the cost, but, but that's, a, that's a very clear challenge we can work on. And um, the other thing is that um, besides this particular material, Is this going to be 
pursuing lots of little pots again, or is it going to be looking for another big? Scheme? Of course, we are also looking to big schemes, um, but we also realized that one of the lessons of this project and also other projects. The nice thing of the project, but this what is university I like, is that you're really pushed to the limit, and you are not only in your luck because you, from the start you have to think of the system. Everything else. Then yeah. you have system people talk to you. Yeah, this is what I want. Then you have materials producers say, yeah, but if you want to do it cheap, then uh, okay, this is, this is your limit. And then as physicists, you are really bound. Uh, sometimes it feel, feels like be bounded, but the other kind, it's a nice challenge. And that's the, that's the fun part of this project. The other side, and I think the channels that put, put that, that sometimes I think the ambition is too high. That, and then you get, let's say, for example, redesigning a manufacturing process and a materials development process. If in three years you can redesign it, but then if you get all the course of the project, let's say, you say, okay, I want to improve that or that, it, it, it's undoable. And the same was if you, if you should choose certain tracks, yeah. and then, um, and I think therefore it's also good to have these, let's say, sidewise, more <coughs> smaller or more fundamental projects uh, where you can play. Because without that playing, it's, it's very difficult to do these big things without it. Mm -hmm. But I definitely are, 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 are in for a new, new phase here also for a big project. Because, uh, it's really, really, really challenging. Yeah, I think we, we need a lot of progress on yeah. the scientific level. Then for the application, we have to together, I, I'm not sure that for how it's really possible because of maintenance nature and shoulders. For us, for, us, for we, we are working for storage on uh, district heating yeah, or something like this. Then we have maintenance, there is no problem, and you don't have problem of knowledge and no problem of material. Mm -hmm. So, question is, storage is uh, an issue, and we know that it's very, very important. How we really We never made this installation before, so we, we make a planning, we work plan, and then uh, it maybe it's very much affected to the sites where we had installation. So we make <coughs> assumptions, and when it comes to real, so maybe you can comment how it's complicated was this installation. Is it what, what you expected, or it's uh, really went to be on? Yeah, but I think also for instance it was modular because we were talking. I said okay, it will be easier in the house if it's in the parts, and you can uh, relatively easy combine. I think without having a demo site, nobody would think about being a modular, yes, like, a, I don't know, like a box, yes, so you put, put one, another, you can enlarge it, decrease, and maybe in that way adjust also to the need, because the need also can be a need of the flat, of the building, or a few buildings, yes? yes? So I think there are many added value, if you, even if your final demonstration is a start of the going into the market, but then also it's, no. it's valuable. I think you, indeed, because what well, you show the picture where yeah. you have very narrow stairs. Yeah. So in Dutch houses, it's very often the installation on the attic where we also yeah. have stairs and need to go upstairs. How to bring that battery? Yeah. But, but, but I agree, generally it's also who is your client, which buildings you are targeting, but sometimes in the beginning of the project you are thinking about these buildings and after some research you said no the focus may be or the first client should be another yes so it's also okay because you are doing research and uh, in the beginning it's not possible with 100 percent yeah. saying this will be my client sometimes it's evolution yeah. Yeah. full disclosure I'm, I'm leading a program in the uk that's building some tcs systems and some phase change material stores and putting them in 
homes. We didn't go down the modular route. And mm. so our wonderful technology supplier <laughs> to the university went, actually, it's going to be about 450 kilos. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, we have jets. Very good. So I think we need to close this workshop because of the time. And it was very nice discussions. And you are a very nice audience, which supports us with a lot of questions. And uh, of course, we will continue our testing of the battery. And you can follow up on our website and to see what is the progress with our heat battery. And we open uh, as an entire consortium for new uh, challenges and new collaborations. Sure. Thank you very much. You will have opportunity to have the heat battery in your yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.